everybody, this is Mr. Moffin coming at you again with another 8 push video. Uh, we're going to be rounding out topic 2.4 today, looking at transatlantic trade. Now, in the last video, we, we focused in on the effects of the Navigation Acts, which are going to be at least putting on paper uh, quite a few rules and restrictions that are going to be limiting the freedom of American colonists, uh, at least from an economic perspective. Uh, now, that being said, in reality, at least for most of the next hundred years, uh, it's going to be enforced very loosely, very lightly. Uh, the use of salutary neglect, is the you know, is going to be kind of defining this. Uh, a lot of loopholes will be found, like trading with natives, or you're going to see corrupt trade enforcement officials looking the other way, taking bribes, whatever. Uh, that's going to define most of that time. However, when we get into the 1680s, there's going to be a little bubble of time where it's not going to be quite uh, salutary neglect. And this is going to be you know, coinciding with the reign of King James II in England. Uh, you know, following the English Civil War of the uh, you know, 1640s, 1650s, you see the crown restored. You have Charles II coming to the throne. Uh, he passes away. And then James II then takes over. Uh, James II is going to be viewed as kind of a, an impulsive and, well, just overall uh, inadequate king for England. And one of those examples is James II's attitude about salutary neglect. Uh, he doesn't like the idea that on the ground in reality, despite the laws that have been passed by Parliament, exerting tremendous you know, authority over the colonies economically, it's not really happening in reality. Not really. Uh, and so James wants to exert that authority, not just on paper, but in reality. And he's going to kind of push heavy on enforcing these navigation acts for the first time, really, in a very real way. And, you know, imagine, you know, those things that are on paper really becoming... Uh, you know, uh, the reality for these American uh, colonists economically. It's not going to be a big surprise that uh, folks are going to be pushing back against it. Not just that these are new laws, per se, but it's the, it's the idea of you've had these laws, you kind of ignored them, now you're going to start to enforce them in a big way and enforce them in, in clearly just kind of an arbitrary way that you're doing it just to kind of flex on the colonies in terms of exerting power. Uh, that's going to lead to a lot of colonial pushback, particularly in New England, where you know that's the that's the shipping hub for the American colonies. Uh, Massachusetts, in particular, is going to be probably the most vocal early on. Although you're going to see some other colonies like New York being pretty vocal also. Uh, in response, we're going to be seeing uh, England cracking down on Massachusetts by suspending its charter. Uh, remember, Massachusetts had a proprietary charter. Uh, that basically kind of gave it, you know, a, a, a certain degree of independence from direct colonial control. And that's going to help to explain why Massachusetts becomes early on this kind of religious haven for, uh, for Puritans. Uh, but that's going to be revoked. Uh, we're going to be seeing England directly asserting control now, turning Massachusetts into a, uh, a crown colony, and in doing so, really poking the bear religiously. Uh, now, granted, you know, what had started out as a very, very clear, almost theocratic style environment in terms of governing, in terms of, you know, the Puritan church, uh, you know, the Calvinist church, if you will, is going to be the only game in town. That's it. Uh, although Rhode Island would be an exception, and we'll get to that later. But uh, the idea being is that they're creating a, a world where... The evil Church of England is persona non grata. Well, that's now going to change. Uh, and note, yes, we already had already seen by the late 17th century that the, the fervor of the Puritan Church was already in decline. It was already kind of waning. It was starting to become what we will call eventually the Congregational Church, which is a much more watered-down ideal, ideals of Calvinism. But now, with the colony of Massachusetts becoming a crown colony, now you're going to see the injection of the Church of England. The hated Anglican Church is now going to be uh, the official church in Massachusetts. Now, that doesn't mean it's 
you know, denying Puritans to pray the way they want to pray and meet however. But in other words, you're now going to be paying taxes to support the Anglican Church. That's not going to make folks happy. Um, and to try to exert even more control, uh, we're going to be seeing James II uh, creating this thing that he calls the Dominion of New England. Go ahead and take a look at this map right here. What had been basically independently operating colonies from New Hampshire all the way down to New Jersey, uh, yes, they were all British, but they all operated independently. They had their own uh, self-governing legislatures for local matters, colonial matters. Uh, you know, they had their own governors. You know, they kind of ran their own show. Well, in an attempt to kind of streamline administrative costs and to once again flex, you know, English uh, crown power and authority over the colonies, James II is going to be basically saying, we're going to try to, in reality, kind of wipe out these colonial boundaries and make it one thing, basically. New England. Even though, yes, I know I've already said New England is east of New York, but for this particular moment, it's kind of lumping uh, New York, New Jersey with those New England colonies. Uh, now, that is going to be very unpopular because, you know, what this is doing is stripping away a lot of the local rule that these colonies had already been used to enjoying. You know, that was one of the benefits of being a colony was that since you're so far away that you can, you know, really do things on your own local level by choosing your own representatives, solving your own problems with your own leaders. That's being stripped away for the most part. Now you're going to be seeing folks from England having more control over what's going on. And so you're going to see a number of uprisings taking place in Massachusetts, in New York. You're going to see mobs forming. You know, folks are getting pretty upset, pretty mad about this. And you could even argue that if it continued down the path that it was going, it could, could, I'm not going to say probable because there's a lot of other factors that play into it, uh, but it could have led to some sort of, you know, uh, organized uprising uh, in terms of, you know, maybe even declaring independence. Maybe, perhaps. Uh, but it doesn't get that far along. And the reason being is that uh, James II's reign on the throne is, is going to be relatively short. Uh, due to him not just being unpopular in the colonies, he's going to be pretty darn unpopular in England itself. Uh, we're going to be seeing James the throne basically forced to give up the throne in what's going to be called the Glorious Revolution. Uh, and so when James II is effectively tossed out and replaced by uh, William and Mary, uh, that is then going to restore in reality this salutary neglect thing. You're going to see the dominion be uh, ripped up, thrown away. You're basically going to see it reverting to what it was pre-James II in terms of you've got your local colonies, you're going to have your local legislatures providing self-rule on the local level. Yes, we've got, you know, the, the rules for the Navigation Acts on paper. That's not being ripped up. Uh, England still reserves the right to have that authority economically, but it's going to be a much more gentle, passive kind of a relationship with the crown uh, in terms of enforcement of that. So we kind of see this return to salutary neglect, and it's going to pretty much stay that way uh, for the next, you know, uh, almost 80 years. Uh, so, you know, we kind of get a little taste of, you know, English-British, you know, tyranny, if you will, at least, that, at least from the perspective of the colonists, very short-lived. It's undone without the colonists really having to declare independence and overthrow the government, but it, it should have been a single signal to England that, hey, if you're going to try to throttle the colonies with high-handed, strong-arm tactics economically, you're going to get a lot of pushback. Uh, but that's not going to be the case. Uh, but we'll get to that eventually. All right, uh, that'll do it for the Dominion New England and taking a look at topic 2.4. We'll see you next time.